Good morning. Welcome to this week's View on Africa. My name is Timothy Walker. I'm a researcher here in the Peace Operations and Peacebuilding Division of the Institute of Security Studies. Uh, today I'll be looking at uh, oceans in peril uh, because we must acknowledge something of profound importance and concern. Our oceans are in peril and not just from harmful shipping practices. Global and systemic pressures and problems abound and they need more than noting, they need concrete counteraction and planning. Therefore, while this may appear to be a misleading picture, it cuts to the core. Fishing and food security have become the major concern for many coastal African states, and more than a few landlocked ones too. The lack of vast stretches of coastline uh, does not mean the sea is not important. Many African communities and, uh, and states are dependent upon fish, and yet stocks are severely overfished and exploited. This means not just a cost of a loss of revenue, but of livelihoods and food security. This also impacts then on planning for development and the prospects for job creation. Importantly too, artisanal and subsistence fishermen are forced to take greater risks, often pushing further out to sea with limited capability, ending up in a reduced, uh, ending up in a reduced safety of life at sea. Greater coastal migration is also occurring as climate change contributes to, creation, to the creation of increasingly inhospitable hinterlands. Uh, populations are increasing and they are also urbanizing. Uh, many African coastal cities are becoming megacities. Uh, two to mention here are Lagos and Dar es Salaam. Uh, the sea ends up being tapped in this case for every last resource. Now this is a scenario with an air of pessimism uh, as the future does not look promising unless we act now to make oceans and seas the sites of better regulation, reduce crimes and enhance research and, um, and study, which is the basis for sound policy making. Our seas and oceans are beset by a number of human caused problems, harmful resource extraction processes and ever increasing amounts of pollution. In the years ahead, for instance, the tonnage of plastics is expected to exceed the tonnage of fishing, a very frightening prospect. Uh, <clears throat> changes are also leading to rises in sea levels and floods. Uh, the warming of the uh, seas is also leading to the melting of ice caps. And there is also an increasing acidity and the loss of vital habitats such as coral reefs, uh, stressing fishing stocks, losing uh, the loss of marine life and also an associated biodiversity decrease. All the while, while the destruction of fishing grounds is often occurring. The combined impact on society should therefore be apparent. The loss of habitats will lead to food insecurity, malnourishment, and this could also then lead to worsening poverty, unemployment and inequality. Therefore, the protection of the seas becomes of existential importance because it affects each and every one of us and everything. Our discussion today is taking place against the backdrop of a major United Nations conference in New York. Uh, I won't go into too much background as I assume many are familiar with the SDGs and the post-2015 development agenda. But here I'd like to draw attention to the interlinkages of the SDGs. Each has a maritime component. <clears throat> For example, look at number two and think of the seas as a source of food, sustainably caught of course, and how that might link to eight and nine or eleven. And remember that coastal cities are growing. Remember too that growing cities inland need to be better linked to ports, requiring in, in, uh, with growing cities uh, improvements in six or 10 or 13 and 17. But of major benefit here is number 14. Now the inclusion of goal 14 was most welcome. Um, I will focus a little on this as it contains important targets and indicators. Uh, the aim of the goal is to conserve and sustainably use the oceans, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. In my reading, though, the wording uh, of each is a little weak. Uh, it's based, based as it must be on a consensus approach. Um, the targets aren't that strong. They're a bit slippery, as it were. Yet, at least they are there, even if we are slightly running out of time. I'll briefly outline them and uh, <clears throat> some of their key points. The first one, by 2025, to prevent and significantly reduce marine pollution of all kinds, in particular from land-based activities, uh, from uh, uh, land, uh, for instance, mentioned pol um, plastics just now, but also um, nutrient pollution. We must be aware of a process called eutrophication, 
which is where nutrient-rich water has run into lakes, for instance, Lake Victoria, where um, there is an increase in plant life and uh, the resultant loss of oxygen and that uh, crowds out um, fishing and marine life in the lakes, um, which then has an impact on shore. There's a reduced amount of fish. That means that uh, fishing communities are likely to suffer in that regard. <clears throat> By 2020, sustainably manage and protect coastal and marine uh, ecosystems and take action for their restoration. The third one is to minimize and address the impact of ocean acidification. The fourth, by 2020, uh, effectively regulate fishing and end destructive fishing practices. This is in order to produce what is known as the maximum sustainable yield in the future. By 2020, and this is the one of most interest for us today and uh, going forward, I believe, uh, by 2020, you conserve at least 10% of coastal and marine areas. Now, remote ocean areas tend to be the home for more life than coastal areas, but their remoteness is also their weakness, uh, especially as stocks elsewhere are depleted. It's all very well declaring oceanic and marine protected areas, but how do we enforce the law there or on the high seas, especially with limited capability in Africa for patrolling and monitoring? Now, partnerships are touted as the next step, and the European Union countries and Norway, for instance, are making commitments in this regard, which will be of help to others. The sixth target and goal is the uh, prohibition of certain forms of fishery subsidies by 2020. And finally, by 2030, increase the economic benefits to small island developing states and least developed countries. There are six of relevance here in Africa. Uh, Cape Verde, the Comoros, uh, Guinea-Bissau, Mauritius, Saitome, Principe, and the Seychelles. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier about the, the weakness, um, SDG 14 does not have many specific indicators, uh, but it is notable for including a concrete indicator of 10% marine protected areas. <clears throat> At present, marine protected areas cover about 15 million square kilometres, which sounds a lot, but it's only about 4.1% of the total oceans uh, area. Um, this is according to a report by the United Nations Secretary General. Um, more are needed, a lot more are needed as the figure of 10% I think is inadequate. Given some existing MPAs are controversial, some exist mostly on paper, and some are too small and just isolated. As you can appreciate, uh, this conference is therefore going to be of great importance for African countries pursuing blue economies, or looking to the ocean as a source of opportunity rather than simply risks and challenges. Uh, good news, and interestingly, Morocco has been elected as a vice chair, and there are seven partnership dialogues everyone will be involved in. The first one on Monday looked at pollution, and then uh, managing, protecting, conserving and restoring marine coastal areas was on Tuesday, as well as the discussion on ocean acidification. Today, we're looking at making fisheries sustainable and then increasing economic benefits to small island states. Uh, remember the ones I just mentioned as well as um, improving market access and also protection for small-scale artisanal fishermen. Remember, that was a very key point right from the beginning, and that's something I think we need to take away going forward. On Thursday, World Oceans Day, we'll be increasing, uh, looking at how to increase scientific knowledge, research, and technology transfer. And finally, on Friday, looking at enhancing conservation and sustainable development through the implementation of international law or other projects in, in accordance with international law. The outcomes, there are three. Adopt a call, a call of action, which is a concise, focused, intergovernmentally agreed text uh, based on consensus again, which has been drafted throughout the year. Secondly, a report summarizing the seven uh, dialogue areas I mentioned earlier and the progress and discussions which resulted. And finally, a, vist, a list of voluntary commitments uh, for the implementation of Goal 14, which are being announced throughout the conference and hopefully also once um, afterwards. Uh, I, at the end, I will mention some which have already been made. Um, now, note tomorrow that, as I say, it's World Oceans Day and the theme is Our Oceans, Our Future. Now, there are hundreds of events planned around the world and it's good to keep an eye out on what area, individual countries did. The Ocean Conference in New York is uh, the most significant, and uh, today's view on Africa is roughly time to coincide with, view on, with um, World Oceans Day. Now, it's important to take the conversation down to look at Africa, uh, where maritime policy is increasingly anchored or being seen through an economic optic. The message for most is that wealth creation 
is, uh, is the goal from the sustainable development of ocean resources. This will require a degree of industrialization, uh, which then would result in job creation. Now, approaches such as here in South Africa, Operation Pakisa, are designed to uh, prompt interest and alert us to the enabling environment that governments are supposed to create to, uh, for business and the development of new or nascent maritime industries. A few to mention here would be shipping and shipbuilding, but also aquaculture, where there are seen as tremendous opportunities for the future for development and uh, I say wealth creation, but also they tie in then to um, job security and food security. But we do have a long way to go. Uh, if we track progress from the World Summit on Sustainable Development, which took place in Johannesburg in 2002, to a uh, summit in Durban in 2009, which led to the creation of a maritime transport charter, and then onwards to a work at the African Union, specifically their 2050 Africa's Integrated Maritime Strategy, and their LOME charter. So we, we do have uh, some work to do. Uh, the charter was signed last year in Togo by 31 countries, and it's the latest attempt to find common commitments between African countries on maritime governance issues, such as how to act at the national level and interact internationally in pursuit of seas and oceans that are the sites of security from crime, the sites of development, of wealth creation, but also are healthy. At the continental level, the African Union has encouraged, I say, been quite active um, by adopting the development plan Agenda 2063. Member states, and now Morocco is a member of the AU, that should mean continental coverage, outlines that Africa's ocean economy, which is three times the size of its landmass, shall be a major contributor to continental transformation and growth. The Lomé Charter promises concerted action and contains a number of limited provisions and articles that, when implemented, should lead to enhanced ocean governance. They're anchored in an understanding that security, development and governance are all interlinked one cannot be achieved with the other, and positive steps and progress made in one should lead to positive steps and progress in the other two. However, the appropriate institutions and mechanisms to implement the provisions are in the process of being clarified, and hopefully they will be framed assertively and, and with greater detail. This draws us back to a point I made a little while ago, that the Charter mentions the development agenda, uh, both 2015 and the UN's 2030 agenda, but it arguably wasn't controversial to include a 10% uh, marine protected areas in line with SDG 14, but that, that unfortunately is not there. Um, these should hopefully then feature in the annexes which are being developed at the moment, which will be delivered in July 2017 and then hopefully should be adopted in an African Union Summit in 2018. The discussion today has largely focused at the level of concerted or multilateral action. But the major work now is required at national level. Uh, states will go home and get to work on the development of ocean governance frameworks, rules, regulations and regimes. And like I say, not simply for small island development states or the 38 coastal states, but hopefully all 55 African states. As I mentioned earlier, and to draw this part of the discussion today to a conclusion, the framings and scenarios we employ tend towards the pessimistic there is too much to do, too little time, too many challenges, too little capacity, and therefore people say there's a lot of indifference or there's not much interest. Yet, some good steps are now being taken. Uh, President Ali Bongo Ondimba of Gabon has announced on Monday a voluntary commitment to create a network of marine protected areas um, amounting to over 20,000 square miles. This network will be the largest in Africa. I also read this morning on the SABC that South Africa's Environmental Minister Edna Molewa, Edna Molewa, excuse me, has uh, proposed 24 new sites. Uh, there's further commitments from Kenya, Seychelles and Algeria. Now that's great and let's not stop there.